to God is important. Don't take it light, lightly. You see, we are spirit beings. Did you hear me say that? We are spirit beings. We are not ordinary creatures. We are spirit beings. The only way we can actually live to our full potentials is by living according to the Word of God. Because we were created by the Word of God. You see that? We were made by the Word of God. So the only way we can actually live is by the Word of God. Make no mistakes about it. Christianity is no religion. There's too many who are treating Christianity as a religion. It's no religion. The Bible says true religion in Christianity is visiting the fatherless and the widow and helping them in their afflictions. That's all the religion there is in Christianity. So true religion is just a part of Christianity. Christianity is no religion. It is the God life in a human being. It is living the God life in this world. That's what it is. Hallelujah. Praise, Praise God. God forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God. One of the things you must learn after you're born again is how to use what God has given you. See, first you have to know your rights. You have to know what belongs to you. You have to know your rights. If you're ignorant, you will suffer. Now, God has said to us in his word, my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. God's people suffer because of the lack of knowledge. And he's not talking about knowledge of chemistry or physics or history or geography and so on and so forth. He's talking about spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge. And you know, sometimes there's a lot of people who read the Bible and then they tell us that... Um, the Bible has to be interpreted in human terminology. So they think that everything in the Bible that's spiritual is merely figurative. They do not realize that there is a real spiritual world. Brothers and sisters, there is a real spiritual world to which we belong. It exists. It's here now. And can I tell you something? The spiritual world is not in the earth. The earth is in the spiritual world. Come on here. Is the earth not a part of the universe? Do you know everything there is in the universe? There is the seen and the unseen. The Bible says that God is a spirit. He is a spirit. And when you read in Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that implies that God was there before the beginning because he pre-existed the earth in the beginning. And in the beginning, he was there creating. So he pre-existed the beginning and pre-existed the earth. And God is a spirit. So it means the spirit realm produced the physical world, which means the spirit realm is greater 
than the physical realm because it produced it because God is a spirit so it took a spirit being God Almighty to make a physical world so the lesser is included in the greater praise the Lord Amen. hey 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 do you get it yes. and then in the spirit realm there are spiritual directions geographical locations for example Jesus said I am from above and then he said the father is above and every time he talked about heaven and the father he talked he said above that's a geographical direction do you understand and the Bible says hell from beneath so hell is beneath so what's he talking about does it mean above the earth does he mean beneath the earth he shows us that the earth as we see it is less than the earth as God sees it you see a physical earth a globe the earth they say is spherical a globe and the people scattered all around it some are standing with respect to others completely opposite their heads are upside down right on the other side of the world and so when we up here say above when they down there say above they're going to point that way and we're going to point this way but God is telling us something the earth is within the spirit realm that surrounds it and he's dealing with man as a spirit there is the outward man and there is the inward man the outward man is the one that you see that's the one that's sitting on the chair right now there is the inward man the inward man is the real man that's the real you that's the spirit man your body is your house is where you live is where you dwell that's what the Bible says when you start in second Corinthians chapter number five it tells you your body is your house that's where you live that's why when a man dies even though there is no physical evidence of any injury his whole body is complete everything is working and sometimes you know even the medical doctors say well we don't know what happened to him we can't tell he wasn't sick nothing 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 and yet the man is dead what happened to him the inward man has gone out the spirit man has gone out and the spirit man is the real man the physical body is just the house and so there's a lot of people who have spent a lot of time a lot of money to train their brains to train their minds they've gone to school most of them have gone to the wrong school <laughs> that's the truth a lot of them went to the wrong school you can tell from the way they're acting come on talk to me <laughs> they have everything in the mess so you can tell they went to the wrong school praise God <laughs> sure even the university professors are not counted out most of them went to the wrong school because they have a lot of things in the mess so they've strained their minds some are wasting their time on their bodies all the time trying to keep 
physically fit with it's all right to an extent but they go beyond it and they try to grow a v some i don't know an a or you know depending on what they want you know all kinds of things some have grown their bodies big some want to be skinny you know so all kinds of shapes and sizes people want to attain it but how many take the same time actually it ought to be more but how many even take the same time to develop their spirit and this is the real man the physical body is not the real man You feed yourself three meals a day, some of you four or five. <laughs> you have all kinds of gadgets for your physical exercise, but you forget your Bible till Sunday morning. Some don't even take it Sunday morning, and I'm coming for you in a moment. <laughs> Your spirit is the real man. Praise God. Tell somebody close to you, your spirit is the real man. <laughs> See, brothers and sisters, success or failure is in our spirits. Of what use is it for a man to become so great? Ten degrees. Five PhDs, the DDDs, and nothing wrong with the academics. And then he goes in and becomes a basketballer, and trains from there to become a, a wrestler, and then acts boxing to it, and then uh, uh, he, he is good in lawn tennis. Think about five, ten spots. He is superb. He's done everything. He knows all of this. You know what? One day, he'll pass out of this world, and all that will be left is history. What impact did he make in the lives of men? Secondly, what is he going to say to his creator? And the Bible says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. At the time of rising, youths were about 60 years old. Are you still here? So if you were 60, you were a youth then. And you know, man's lifespan has gotten shorter and shorter, shorter and shorter. You know why? You know why men don't live as long as they used to? Do you realize they don't live as long as they used to? Why? Did God change? No. Man is continually inventing new sins. Yes, and sin is what cuts a man's life. There's so much sin in the world. And we keep inventing new ones. And the more we invent them, the shorter the lifespan of man. Praise God. But I want to begin to show you from today's subject what to do with your life according to God's word and live happy, fulfilled, joyful, walking in God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You don't have to be 90 years old before you stop and say, let me find out whether I've been a success. No, you can be a success at every stage. Success is a now life. All right? It is a now life. 
It's not history. It's a now life. And you know, when the Bible talks about success, it talks about permanent success. Permanent. Not going up to come down. There's a lot of people who go up to come down. And, and, and you know, most people in the world, that's their story. They go up to come down. So there are lots of has-beens, have-beens, and so on, used-to-bees, so on. X, 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 former, former, former. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, life can be more fulfilling than that. Amen. Amen. Why do things happen to different people? Why, especially God's children? They said the boss was traveling. There were 15 people inside. Three people died. And the three of them were born again. The other 12 didn't even know God. Why did the three die? I may not be able to give you all the answers. Because God has all the answers. And we have to study some more to find out all of what we haven't known. But surely... There's something about God we need to come to understand, and that is the Bible says God is good. You have to settle that in your heart. God is good. Settle that in your heart forever. God is good. Say that with me. God is good. Say it again. God is good. All right. Somebody had a baby. The child grew up three years, three years old and slept one night and didn't wake up and died. And somebody said, well, God walks in mysterious ways. We never know the will of God. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a slap on the face of God. <laughs> Bible says God is good. Why will he let a woman carry a pregnancy for nine months? Give birth to that child. Let you have that child for three years and come like a hawk and pick the child up in the night time. What kind of a good God is that? You think God loves it to see people mourning? What kind of a good God is that? So say, well, we cannot interpret God. That's the lie of the devil. That's what the devil has made many Christians believe for so long. They will not accept their lack of knowledge. They want to believe that this God Almighty, because we can't stand against Him. We don't know where He's coming from. Away. God is mysterious, they say. So, God has become a killer. What kind of a God do you serve? I serve the God who brought Jesus to this world. <laughs> to die for us. And He gave us an example. He was touched when He saw that widow woman. Whose son, whose only son died. Jesus was touched. He was on his journey going someplace else when he saw her. And stopped and went and raised the man, the young man, the son of the widow. And gave him back to her. That's the kind of God I serve. The one who was, who was touched when the noble man said, My daughter is dying. Please come help me. Jairus. He invited Jesus, please come and help me. Jesus wasn't too busy. He said, all right, I'll go with you. And raised that little girl from the dead. Even the nobleman's son, another one, who was sick and dying, Jesus gave the word. He was touched. A poor woman was dying. She used to be rich. She spent all her money on doctors for 12 long years and became poor from paying them. 
That's what the Bible says. She came and taught Jesus. She was healed, but there was more. And Jesus called her and made her whole. <laughs> Ten lepers came to Jesus. They were outcasts. They were crying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus healed them. Gave them new bodies. Even the maimed were healed. Those who had their limbs amputated, they were healed. That's the kind of God that I serve. The one who was touched at the grave of Lazarus. The Bible says he wept. He was moved to tears. And then came to the entrance of that cave and called him by name and said, Lazarus, come out. And the Bible says he that was dead came out. That's the kind of God that I serve. Do you understand? That's the one I believe in. The Bible says he's touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He's touched with it. That's the God that I serve. The God who is moved when somebody loses his job. He's moved. That's the God I serve. But you know, a lot of us, we got answers for everything. And we always, oh, oh well, God works in mysterious ways. He took your job. Yeah, he's taking their jobs. He's taking their husbands. He's taking their wives and their children, killing everybody. And they say, God's doing it. Yeah, he's taking them to heaven because he needs a greater population in heaven. <laughs> what kind of a God do you serve? Some people say divine healing is not for today. There are no real miracles today anymore. Ha, thank you for your announcement that God has changed. <laughs> God was loving back in those days. Why did he heal them? He loved them. That's why he healed them. You mean he's changed? He doesn't want to heal us anymore. He's changed. <laughs> what kind of a God do you serve? He says, my people suffer. For the lack of knowledge. Bible says he raises the poor out of the dust. That's the God that I serve. He doesn't want you wallowing in the mud. He'll pick you up. Clean you out. Make you a prince. Glory to God. That's the God that I serve. Hallelujah. Proverbs. Chapter number one and verse thirty three. You know, you can be faithful. Listen to me. Faith and faithfulness are not the same. Hey, look up now. Hear me say it again. Faith and faithfulness are not the same. Hello, hello, hello. We're going to say it again. Faith and faithfulness are not the same. Too many of God's children confuse faithfulness with faith. Faithfulness is serving God. You come to the house of God. You do all the nice things that God said to do. You go on evangelism. You win souls. You pray consistently. You're a great intercessor. You don't even commit sins. You are faithful. You can be trusted. Anything that is given to you to do is done perfectly. You are trustworthy. That's faithfulness. You can be counted on. And there are many Christians like that. So because of that, they do not understand why are these things happening to me? Why does the devil have a field day in my family? Why? They want to know why. I've been faithful to God. I give my tithes. I give my offerings. I do this and I do that. I'm faithful to God. What is it that I have not done? And they cry. And they break down there. <laughs> why? In the last 55 years, I've been serving God. Why? Why is this happening to me? Why? 
They say, why has God done this to me? Why? The most popular question in heaven is, why? Why? So, oh God, why? 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 The whole house burnt. Why? What I, I've, I, my whole life, oh, everything is gone. Why? I'm outside serving God. I expected God to take care of everything that belongs to me over here. I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do. Why is God not taking charge of whatever I've left in this earth? Why? Some get sick and they ask God, why? Why am I sick? I'm serving you. I'm doing everything you want me to do. Why am I sick? Oh, why? Why? Somebody say, Why? I want to tell you why. <laughs> Faith and faithfulness are not the same. They're not the same. Faithfulness is good. It is honorable. It is required. But it will not substitute faith. For the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. It doesn't say without faithfulness. It is without faith, he says. Faith is a required necessity. Sounds like tautology. But it is to strengthen that word. All right, you with me? Now, while you have that in your mind, I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number one, and I'm reading verse 33. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. But whoso, <laughs> whoso hearkeneth unto me, did you hear that? What is it to hearken? It means simply to hear to do. Hearing to do is what it means to hearken. Hearing to do. Not just to hear. To hear for the purpose of doing. So he says, Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil now i want you to mark that scripture it is very 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 important he says anybody who hearkens to me shall dwell safely safely shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil from fear of harm from fear of evil destruction devastation whoso hearkeneth unto me and i said to hearken means to hear to do hearing to do hearing for the purpose of doing say i hear to do good now that's what God said he said anybody who hearkens to me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil now I want you to mark one hearkening to God making you dwell safely and also being quiet from fear of evil praise the Lord Jesus Christ <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, you remember uh, the rich young ruler in the Bible who came to Jesus and said to him, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, um, you know the commandments. 
thou shall not do this and thou shall not do that and thou shall do and thou shall do and so on and so forth then the man said something listen he was rich all right and he came to Jesus and said what shall I do to inherit eternal life and Jesus gave him the commandments and said you know the commandments do this and the man said I have done all this from my youth that's what made him rich hey come on come on come on are you following what I'm telling you that's what made him rich he said to Jesus he wasn't lying Jesus gave him the commandments and said go and keep these commandments and you shall leave and he said I have kept all these ones from my youth and according to the law of Moses if you kept all those commandments God would make you rich so the man was rich from keeping those commandments I had a reason for telling you that all right now he said anybody who hearkens to me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil praise the Lord Amen. okay now let us visit uncle Job are you ready to see brother Job all right turn in there now book of Job you know the story one day something happened he lost all his children in one blast the next time he lost all his business in one sweep Whew. all the business was gone his family was gone remaining his wife all his wealth was gone in a moment of time even the houses went down his real estate was gone in one sweep I mean when the devil shows up brother there's no telling how far he would go if you let him listen listen and let me tell you this the devil the devil don't pity nobody if he takes one he's coming for the next one and the sooner you realize what's happening to you and stop the devil the better for you you say I got seven children if he has taken one he's coming for the next one don't take it lightly he doesn't like to stop hello Hi. hello 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 Hi. all right Job are you in the book of Job yes. I told you how he lost everything now let's go let's find out what was Job's problem why did Job lose his business why did Job lose his family why did all this happen to Job in one little sweep the book of Job chapter number three <clears throat> I want you to see the kind of life that this faithful man he was faithful to God Job was a faithful man I want you to see the kind of life mr. faithful was living you know when we see faithful people we are never able to tell the kind of life they actually are living because they're so faithful I mean they dress like Christians they they talk nicely religiously kindly I mean they're just cool it's like when you see mr. and mrs. wearing and co you you think that that means they are united no they may have been fighting the clothes are just for the for others you know what I'm talking about now I'm not against and co wear them they're nice they're colorful but that doesn't mean that wearing the same clothes means the same heart praise God uh, all right verse 25 third chapter of the book of Job here when, when Job lost everything here's what he said here's what he said and here is where we find who Job really was on the inside he said for the thing which I greatly 
greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Stop there. Job was a professor in fear. <laughs> I'm serious. He was expert in fear. He was, I mean, he was good at it. Some people are good in fear. I mean, if you want to know the definition of fear, that's them. That was Job. He says, I greatly feared. The thing which I greatly feared. So all the time God's blessing Job, Job was living in fear. What is fear? It's the opposite of faith. Job was faithful, but had no faith. Because fear and faith don't work together. Can you see it? Fear is having negative faith. It is actually faith in the ability of your adversary. Instead of faith in the ability of God. So Job was blessed of God. But Job was afraid that God was not powerful enough or willing enough to keep what he blessed him with. He said, the thing which I greatly feared has happened. I knew it would happen. Uh, see now. Okay. I knew. That was Job. Let's continue. Look at something else. You would you, see this wonderful Job now. Look at verse 26. Now he's lying his teeth. Look at this. I was not in safety. How, how dare Job. Can you see the man he was? He says, I was not in safety. Neither had I rest. Neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. I want to show you the kind of life Job was living. He said, I was not in safety. I had no rest of mind. Every time there was a noise outside, I looked through the window. He said, I had no rest. And I was not quiet. I always said it. I told people, I don't know, I don't know what... I was not quiet. I kept talking about it. Yet trouble came. What we read just now. Anyone who hearkens to God shall dwell safely. Right? And shall be quiet from fear of evil. Job said that he was not safe. Job said that he was not quiet from the fear of evil. He said it. But did God actually protect Job? We're going to find out. We're going to find out. Job said he was not safe. Go to chapter 1. Hmm. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Job said he was not safe. Have you ever heard people say, there's a, there's a noise somewhere. Says, Are we safe? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> not as long as you're talking like that. See, when you, when you give your heart to Christ and you're born again, you need to know what belongs to you. You need to know your rights and your privileges in Christ Jesus. And then you need to know how to use your tongue, brother. <laughs> Let me remind you of something. In the book of Genesis, when you study in chapters 1, 2, and 3, you recall that God made man. He created man in his own image. You remember that? He had Adam and Eve put in the garden. God made that garden. And then in the garden, there were two important trees apart from others. There was one that was called the tree of life. Hmm. The tree of life was the tree that if a man would eat of it, would never die. Then in that same garden was another tree. It was called the tree 
of the knowledge of good and evil. God, you know, somebody said that God put it there to tempt man. No, he didn't put it there to tempt or test man. Not at all. He put it there for a reason. We don't have all the time for it today. But see, God's going to raise judges. And that was the reason for that tree. And a man was not supposed to eat of that tree until he was recreated. But he didn't know it. And you have to follow God without having to expect him to explain everything to you. But anyway, Satan was out to make man not only break God's word or break God's law, but to get him to also eat of the tree of life. Now, if Adam, after eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, had eaten of the tree of life, he would have been like Satan. Irredeemable. He would have lived forever as a sinner. You get that? And God would not be able to redeem him. Not out of a, um, an act of ability, but um, an act of principle. Praise God. So Satan wanted man to eat of the tree of life as well. And that's what God had to stop. He sent an angel quickly to protect the tree of life and to stop Adam from taking of that tree. And he had to drive Adam and Eve out of the garden. So that he tells us in that chapter, the third chapter, when he studied in the book of Genesis, God had to stop them from eating of the tree of life so that they could be redeemed. Now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, huh? You want to know? Yes. Proverbs chapter 15 Are you there? Yes. I want you all to read verse 4 and read it out loud. One, two, go. What did he say? A wholesome tongue is what? He says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. God's word. Perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Hmm. Let me tell you what he's saying. He says a wholesome tongue. What, what, is, what is wholesome? Wholesome. Wholesome is, uh, um, is the same word, the same Hebrew word that's used for health. In Proverbs chapter 4, when you read from verse 20 to verse 22, in Proverbs chapter 4, the same, same Hebrew word, see? And um, it means cure, it means health, it means healing, and then he says curative. And because of the synonym curative is why you find the marginal reference Bible giving you in verse 22 Proverbs chapter 4 um, he uses the word medicine to their flesh why because medicine is any substance that is assumed or uh, accepted or professed to have curative powers or ability. Praise God. Amen. So when it says a wholesome tongue and uses the same Hebrew word, it's mape. Mape is Hebrew word for cure or curative. And so meaning medicinal. 
Do you get it? So when it says a, a wholesome tongue, it means a tongue that's curative. Is a tree of life. Now, how can that be? Study that Proverbs chapter, two, chapter 4 from verse 20 again. It says, my son attend to my words, incline thy ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to those that find them, and health to all their flesh. What? My words, God's words, are life to those that find them, and they are my pay to their flesh. What? God's words. Now he's telling you, if your tongue is full of God's words, your tongue is a tree of life. Your tongue is a tree of life. The tongue that speaks God's words is a tree of life. Then he says, but perverseness, perverseness means crookedness. You go this way and this way. Today you talk right, tomorrow you talk wrong. Today you say it positively and the next day you say negatively. You talk fear today and talk fake tomorrow and talk fear the next day. So you're living a crooked life. So he says, but crookedness therein, crookedness in the tongue is a breach in the spirit. What is a breach in the spirit? When you break a wall, a hole in the wall. Come on, are you here? He says it's a breach in the spirit. That means there's a hole in the wall. There's a crack in the wall. And someone can pass through that crack. That's what he's saying. He's saying the fence, the hedge is broken. When there is crookedness in your tongue. When your tongue is inconsistent with truth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, this is so vital. You have to understand this. You've got to understand this. You've got to. You've got to. All right. Now, do you remember? Did I ask you to open to anywhere that I haven't read to you yet? Where is it? Job. Okay, okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. Now, the other day we were talking about meditation and I tried to explain some things to you. In, in, in Joel, uh, Joshua chapter number 1 and in verse 8 where he says this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate. And I told you that one of the synonyms of that word, Hagar, that was translated meditate means to imagine. You remember that? To imagine, to visualize. Praise God. Okay. And when you meditate, you mutter. You talk. You speak. You growl. You roar. That's meditate. It gets stronger and stronger. Now, let me show you something in the book of Psalms, chapter 15. Psalm 15. Have you seen it? I want to read in verse verse 1 from verse 1. He says, Who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? In other words, who is going to work in the glory of God? Who is going to work in his presence? Who is going to work in the anointing of God? Who? Who is it? He says. 
Then he tells us in verse 2, notice in verse 2. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Now, there's where a lot of people miss it. They don't have a problem walking uprightly. They don't have a problem walking righteousness, doing right. They don't have a problem with that. But then they have a problem with speaking the truth. Now, I want you to notice what it doesn't say. Go back to it. He says, he that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He didn't say, and speaketh the truth with his neighbor. Now, I'm aware that there are a few translations that render it in a way that seems to suggest that you are speaking the truth to someone else. But a lot of times, in these particular translations are those who, to a large extent, have paraphrased those statements. All right? Now, when you start it from the original Hebrew rendering, it doesn't say that at all. He says exactly what you have in the King James. I'm going to explain it. He says, he that speaketh the truth in his heart. This has nothing to do with talking to somebody. In the Amplified Version, it gives it to us clearly. Who's got the Amplified? Anybody here? Thank you. Let me read it to you from the Amplified. Open it. Psalm 15. In verse 2. He who walks and lives uprightly and blamelessly, he who walks righteousness and justice and speaks and thinks the truth in his heart. He speaks and thinks the truth in his heart. He's not talking about talking to another person. Speaking and thinking the truth in your own heart. That's meditation. Meditating on God's word. He says if you're going to walk in the glory of God, if you're going to walk in the anointing of God, if you're going to see the power of God manifested in your life, you have to speak the truth in your heart. You have to think the truth. In other words, you have to meditate on God's word in your heart. Talk it in your heart. Bible says study to show yourself approved. Study. You got to study. Jesus said, search the scriptures. Think the truth in your heart. See, if you don't think the truth in your heart, you never you will not speak the truth. See, truth in God's in God's realm, in the God life, is not when you're coming from that side and say, Where are you coming from? And you say, Yes, I'm coming from that side. So that's the truth. No. There are facts and there are truths. Truth is reality. You understand? You're stating facts. And some facts are not true. Oh, you didn't catch it. He's not talking about facts. A lot of us think he's talking about facts. He's not talking about facts. He's talking about truth. Truth is different from facts. A fact may be a truth, but a fact may also not be truth. And there's a lot of you living in facts right now. I mean, you have a tumor in your body, that's a fact, yeah. You have an infection in your blood, that's a fact. The doctor says it's there. It's a fact, but it's not a truth, brother. But Jesus didn't say you shall know the facts. He said you shall know the truth. And the truth shall deliver you from the facts of life. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Separate truths from facts. He that speaketh the truth in his heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, ho, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. The truth. You speak it in your heart. 
Somebody says, you're a blockhead. You, 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 you tell yourself on the inside, I know I'm not a blockhead. I'm a genius. Glory to God. I know who I am. I'm intelligent. I know who I am. I got a sound mind. Don't forget it. The Bible says we have not been given a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear. But a power of love and of a sound mind. I have a sound mind. Don't call me a fool. I have a sound mind. That child is not a blockhead if he's born again. He's got a sound mind. Don't tell your son he's a blockhead. Don't tell your daughter she's a fool. No. Show them what God has given to them. Don't let anybody talk them down. You can talk my children down. No, no. No, no, no. I will release words like this on you until... <laughs> Praise God. I know who I am. I have a sound mind. See that? See that? Now, 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 this is a, this is a principle of the kingdom. You have to speak the truth in your heart. Now truth is revealed. Jesus said you shall know the truth and it will make you free. Now let's, let's get to brother Job one more time. Are you ready to see Job? Yes. Now Job said something. He said I was not safe. <laughs> I was not safe. I was not at rest and I was not quiet about it yet trouble came Job you were not safe so you mean God blessed you and wasn't ready to protect what he gave to you there are people who have things they are afraid to use some of you have cars you can't use you are afraid to use them You have a house you're afraid to enter. <laughs> you have jewelries you are afraid to wear. Who gave you these things? Maybe it's not God. The lines are falling onto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I refuse to fear. Thank you, Lord. Can we see Job? Hey, in Job chapter number one, you know, when, when God Almighty engaged Satan in a dialogue in chapter one before he attacked Job, all right, let's hear what Satan said to God. Let's hear what Satan said to God about God and Job. Verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Has not thou made an edge about him? Huh? He's saying, haven't you built a wall of fence around Job? How did Satan know? Because he had been there several times and he tried to go through and he couldn't. So Job was protected. But Job was out there talking fear. Hmm. Ha, ha, ha. Has thou, verse 10, has not thou made an edge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? He's been everywhere. He's tried all the sides. He couldn't come in. Thou hast blessed. Satan accuses God now. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. Those of you who say prosperity is from the devil, hear the devil, let the devil preach to you then. <laughs> the devil accuses God. He says, I'm not the one who blessed Job, it's you. <laughs> Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Did you notice that? Satan had been there to attack Job and he found out that the man 
was faced all around. He went to his house, he couldn't find a way to get in. Job was heavily fortified. There was no way to go through. And he was frustrated and went away. And God said, have you considered Job, my servant? There ain't nobody like him in the whole world. He's faithful. And Satan said, ah, does he fear you for nothing? I mean, I've been there. You built a wall around you. Ah, I know, I know what you're doing. You blessed you. And that's the reason he's talking like that. All right. All right. Here's where some people are also missing. Let me show you something. In verse 11, Satan said this, But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now, a lot of times they forget that when you read the Bible, verse 2 doesn't necessarily follow verse 1. As though it happened immediately like you see BAM and it's there you get it in verse 12 the Bible says and the Lord said unto Satan behold all that he hath is in thy power only upon himself put not forth thine hand so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and then you know trouble started with Job now let me show you something when God said behold all that he has is in your power what was God saying was God delivering Job's blessings to the devil absolutely not he wasn't doing that you say how'd you know because God doesn't break his word he built a hedge around Job God doesn't build a hedge and break a hedge he doesn't do it because God never works against his word you say how do you know hmm. the God who said thou shalt not lie you think he lies you think he lies the God who said the soul that sinned it shall die do you think he would sin okay let me show you something Ecclesiastes chapter 10 I hear that some people call it Ecclesiastics it's not sticks it's these Ecclesiastes chapter 10 The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee, will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, he will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. He will rest in his love, he will rest in his love. He will joy over thee. Ecclesiastes in chapter number 10 I want to read to you from verse 8 in fact I want you all to read verse 8 together one to go one more time Whoso breaketh an edge, a serpent shall bite him. So God will not break an edge. Because he said, whoso breaketh an edge, the devil will get him. Satan has been given a right to go through a broken edge. If you built the head yourself it's a different case here he's surely dealing spiritually because you're not the one that built the hedge he's talking about he says who so dig at a pit shall fall into it he doesn't mean if you dug a pit for something no it's not talking about you he's talking spiritually that's when you create trouble for someone else he's telling you you will be in that trouble Says, Whoso breaketh an edge, a serpent shall bite him. 
And the Bible calls Satan that old serpent, the devil. What about the edge that was built around Job? Who broke it? It was Job. We just read it. He said perverseness in the tongue is a breach in the spirit. It's a hole in the wall. That's what God saw when he said to Satan, now look what he has is in your power, but don't touch his life. God had to, in his mercy, restrict Satan. He didn't deliver Job's goods to Satan. Job delivered his goods to Satan through the perverseness of his lips. He said, I was not safe, yet he was safe. Even the devil knew that Job was safe. God blessed Job. And if God blesses you, he takes care of you. Can you see Job's problem? He had fear and he was talking fear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes people ask themselves, do you mean to say that... Um, I mean, it's like I'm trying to blame you for whatever has happened in your house or in your life. I'm not blaming you. I'm telling you you're responsible. Let me show you something. You want to see it? Mm -hmm -hmm. All right, turn to First Timothy. Second Timothy, sorry, Second Timothy. <clears throat> I want to show you something. Second Timothy, Chapter Two. Have you seen it? Are you sure you've seen it? Yeah. All right. Let me read to you from verse 24. From verse 24. Verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Hey, servant of the Lord. The Bible says you must not what? Strive, but be gentle, not only to the good and kind, but to all men. That's just, make sure you take that home with you. All of you who are servants of the Lord. Aren't you all servants of the Lord? Don't fight anybody. All right? Be gentle. Bible says, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what that suggests? That good is stronger and more powerful and more influential than evil. But evil people don't know that. They think when you're wicked, you always win. No way. Good is more powerful than evil. God has said so. He says, overcome evil with good. It's possible. We'll talk about that in another service. All right. Now, he says, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, verse 25, in meekness. I want you to see something he says in verse 25, very powerful, very instructive. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I want you to underline oppose themselves. I'll explain that to you. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, verse 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Recover themselves. What is he saying? Recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. In other words, if the devil has attacked your life, if the devil has attacked your home, if the devil 
has attacked anything that concerns you, God expects you to recover yourself from that trap. You don't need anybody to pray for deliverance for you. See that? Which means you can come out of it. He says to recover yourself. Recover yourself from the snare of the devil. If you've been entrapped, recover yourself. Look at it, it says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have been taken captive at the devil's will. Recover yourself. So when we have deliverance meetings, we're supposed to be delivering sinners. Because the Christians are the deliverers. And if for any reason you, you, you submitted yourself to demonic oppression, the Bible says, recover yourself. Come out. Glory to God. Hey, glory. You know what that means? It means you can just walk out of the devil's territory anytime you choose. Come out by yourself. Walk out of sickness. Walk out of disease. Walk out of fear. You don't need to fast and pray to come out of it. Are you hearing me? Just walk out of it. Walk out of bondage. Walk out of poverty. Just walk out. You say, how? I want to walk out. Do you really want to walk out? Yeah. All right. It's a simple way. How? Just do. You know what? It's called dress for the job. Hey, what do you want to be? What do you want to be like? Dress for the job. Do you remember that lady who hadn't had any, any child for 13 years or so? She had one daughter and then um, about 13 years or something like that. Something like that. 13, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm getting it right now, but something like that. She gave her testimony and um, she, she wanted to have another child and couldn't. And then she received the word during the service. And, and she believed she got a miracle. She said at home, she began to practice walking like a pregnant woman. It's called dress for the job. She said she began to act like she was pregnant. She would walk like she was pregnant. And she hadn't gotten pregnant yet. But she was acting it. She was doing it. She was telling herself she was pregnant. And it was so. <laughs> and she got a baby. That's the way to do it. I mean, what are the... That's just like the, any story of faith in the Bible. Dress for the job. That's the way to walk out. Walk out of the devil's pain. You just say, all right, I'm done with it. Call yourself what God calls you. If you have been living in fear, you just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I reject fear. Then from now, start talking faith. I'm a successful child of a successful God. A prosperous child of a prosperous God. Glory to God. I'm walking in righteousness. I'm walking in the glory of God. You understand what I'm talking about? You just walk out of the devil's bondage. All you have to do is say yes to your new personality and start acting that way. Let me show you something. What was Job? Somebody says, all right, all right. Now, now, what was Job supposed to have done? Job was supposed to have been talking righteousness, thinking truth. God said, if you hearken to me, you dwell in safety. Are you hearkening to God? You say, yes, I am. All right. Then you are dwelling in safety. You cannot hearken to God and at the same time say, I am not safe. So you say, I am hearkening to God and so I live in safety. I am quiet from evil.
quiet from the fear of evil. I do not walk in fear. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Bible says in the path of the righteous is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. Therefore, in my pathway, there is no death. There is no death. In the way that I travel, there is no death. You see that? In my way is life. In my pathway, there is no death. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There is no death in my pathway. I come walking. I come traveling. I come flying. No matter how I do it, there is no death in my way. Your tongue is a tree of life. Use it. Are you ready for this? Do you know? Do you know where you are today is a result of what you said yesterday? Your life today is the character of all your talking all these years. You got to where you are by the way you were talking. That's what brought you here. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 19, the Bible tells us, As a man's face is reflected by the water, so his heart reflects his personality. Wonderful. I said, wonderful. You, you need to get this. What does this imply? You know, he says, when you look into water, you see your face. You know, it's, uh, it, it reflects you. He says, so your heart, your spirit reflects your personality. Now, but your spirit, your spirit receives God's word and produces for you whatever you feed into it. That's the reason God told us to meditate. He said success is in your spirit. So meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. Now the word of God has the ability, the divine ability to fly you to the next level of your life. Listen, for example, if you're a student, why are you reading your books? You've got to put the word of God to work. The race is not to the swift, neither is the battle to the strong. So what are you going to do? Why are you starting your books? You need God's word. You need to talk God's word because God's word is the one that has the power, the divine ability to give you permanent success. Permanent success. It will open doors for you. It will bring favor into your life. And you have to be consistent. Listen, there is no falling for the child of God that walks in this light. You cannot fall. It's not possible. You cannot fall. Amen. See, the word of God doesn't fail. And when you stand on the word, it will carry you. Hallelujah. 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 Now, this thing I want to show you is to use your tongue. You're going to train yourself. You've got to train yourself. You have, see, you're going to, your tongue is what God has given you, not for licking ice cream.